In a time of profound social and cultural change, an entire generation of young Americans stood united in their desire for more powerful cars, fueling the greatest horsepower war in automotive history. Screeching rubber through turns, roaring down back streets and country lanes, with fun-loving drivers in their wild and powerful dream machines. Just about anyone could afford to fly down the road in a boldly styled, attention-grabbing American icon, the muscle car. Hello, I'm Chip Foose, coming to you from Vic's Garage at the historic headquarters of Edelbrock in Torrance, California. Cars have been rolling off the assembly line under the General Motors banner since 1908. But perhaps the most exciting cars in GM's history hit the road in 1970. Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, and Buick each brought something different to the table. Their flagship A-body designs combined aggressive styling and preposterously powerful engines. These were the Alpha Dogs, the baddest muscle cars to ever wear GM badging. Nineteen seventy was probably the best year across the board. All the manufacturers, not just General Motors, but Ford and the Chrysler Group, everybody was firing on all cylinders. That was the, the coming together of a lot of elements. Some gorgeous designs, uh, racing's influence, engine technology had progressed to the point where really bigger was better. If you didn't have at least a 427 cubic inch engine, you may as well just go back to the porch. You had the, um, the 426 Hemi, the 440 six packs, 427 engines, and then of course the 454 is found in the Chevelle LS6, for instance. So it was either go big or go home. The vehicles in 70, it was just a perfect storm for just stupid fast automobiles, especially when you talk about the General Motors A bodies. It's a grand slam. I mean, there wasn't a dog in the group. The styling was a lot more aggressive. The engines had just gotten even bigger. Uh, the graphics packages were a little bolder, but they weren't excessive. And it was just the right balance, you might say, between social irresponsibility and being able to live with a car in the real world. They looked great, they sounded great, they drove well. It was just a wonderful year. As had been the case for the past few years, the Chevy Chevelle was leading the GM sales pack. But 1970 would see a new kid in town under the Chevelle's hood. Engine option RPO Z15 SS, better known to horsepower fanatics as the LS6. This solid lifter, high compression big block used by Chevy as a response to the Buick Stage 1 was only offered in the Chevelle for a single year. But it made quite an impression it featured the largest intake port heads ever made for a Chevelle, along with the most responsive ignition available, a Holley four-barrel and an aluminum intake manifold. The Chevelle LS6 was a bully. It was a 454 cubic inch, rated ostensibly at about 425 horsepower. At first, the sticker on the air cleaner said 450, and the insurance companies went, eh, eh, eh. okay, we'll put a four and a quarter horse on there. We'll make it sound better. This thing, yeah, it put out 425 horse on its way to 500, and it had about 500 pound-feet of torque, which meant there wasn't a set of street tires that were safe. The LS6 Chevelle was a broad shoulder bully looking to kick somebody's ass. This black-on-black -black survivor from the Wellborn Muscle Car Museum is a prime example of these lethal animals. A Turbo 400 manages the engine, and interior appointments include astroventilation, a performance gauge cluster, dual exhaust, 14-inch wide oval tires on sport wheels, and power disc brakes. The LS6 was offered in both coupe and convertible bodies with optional cowl induction. A well-tuned example could run ETs in the low 13s with zero to 60 speed of 6.1 seconds. No, 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 no. 
just shy of 4,500 were built. And even then, they were considered one of the toughest beats on the block. When I was running around on the streets as a, as a kid in my Charger RT, the dream car to pull up beside me was a Chevelle SS454 and hopefully LSX version. Because if you could outrun one of those, you had, you had pretty much done a day's work. A well-driven Chevelle LS6 had pretty much trounce almost everything. But yeah, you didn't really call, come across an LS6 very often. But when you did, you were going to get a good look at its taillights. in-house rivals go head to head. They were identical as far as performance. So he must really love the Chevelle because he didn't drive my GTO or else he didn't get on the GTO because the GTO will just beat it up. The best muscle cars don't just get you down the road in a hurry. They also make a lasting impression. In 1970, few cars better embodied this intersection of performance and appearance than the Judge Option Pontiac GTO. Road Test Magazine said that the Judge was, quote, not for people who are shy about being looked at. In any year where muscle cars were at the very height of their virility, the Judge stood alone as arguably the greatest GTO ever built. The 1970 Judge had a lot to live up to, not least of which being the GTO's illustrious heritage. Pontiac, which you know, for, to, to many people, invented the muscle car with the GTO in 64. By 1970, the judge was really not taking any prisoners. Big engines, 400 cubic inch, a um, lot of horsepower, and uh, a lot more graphics, you might say. John DeLorean was enamored with uh, Flip Wilson's portrayal on TV of the judge who come to judge and that's where the car got the name and John DeLorean at the time was still with Pontiac but just about to leave and he loved performance he, he loved to go fast and he made sure the GTO wasn't asleep at the wheel it could hold its own against most of the other muscle cars out there beat a lot of them the modestly successful launch of the variant in 1969 ensured that the judge would be on the bench the following year with fairly minor tweaks. Now, when we offered it again with the Ram Air 3 and the Ram Air 4 as the only option, and uh, kind of uh, interjected it with a fairly heavy advertising program behind it. And it was a very successful, and is today, a very important part of Pontiac heritage, and particularly GTO heritage. When you think of the GTO, most people will think of the judge. Visual changes to the car included a new nose with exposed headlamps, a refreshed back end, and a more prominent rear spoiler. Under the hood squatted Pontiac's powerful 400 cubic inch engine, which output either 366 or 370 horsepower, depending on whether the engine sported the standard Ram Air 3 or the optional Ram Air 4. The hood itself featured functional hood scoops controlled by a knob under the dash. Variable ratio power steering and substantially upgraded suspension made the Judge a smoother ride than the previous year. As stunning as the Judge is as a coupe, it's truly breathtaking without the roof. This restored example, one of only six Judge ragtops to sport both the Ram Air 4 option and the four-speed transmission, is attired in palladium silver, one of the more restrained colors available that year. The four-speed is controlled with a Hurst T-handle shifter rising from the optional center console. The car also features rally gauges, color-matching hood tack, and five-spoke rally wheels. And while the layman might find little difference in performance between the Judge and the rival Chevelle LS6, try telling that to a GTO owner. The gentleman from Hemmings drove my judge the same day and he drove the, uh, the Chevelle. He wrote that they were identical as far as performance. So he must really love the uh, Chevelle because he, he, he didn't drive my GTO or else he didn't get on the GTO because the GTO will just beat it up. The judge also represented a shift in the muscle car movement where pure performance was no longer the sole determinant of a car's quality. 
The visual appeal, I think, was the styling package. They, in 1970, they made approximately 3,700 judges, people that have GTOs or cloning theirs to look like a judge because of the stripe package, because of the performance. So I, I think, I think it's, it's a head turner. It's an attention getter. And it's a lot of fun, just a lot of fun to drive. Coming up, the perfect way to drive a muscle car. Put the top down and you go burbling, looking for trouble in this vehicle. It's just a lot of fun. And then when you nail the throttle and those big dual exhausts just start screaming and oh, there's nothing like it. Ahead of Pontiac in GM's hierarchy, Oldsmobile had spent the 60s making a tidy profit with its 442 option package for the Cutlass despite the fact that Olds had to overcome its image as a more conservative automaker compared to its GM stablemates, Chevy and Pontiac. Horsepower fanatics would become true believers of the Olds 442 in 1970 after a nearly decade's worth of redesign and refinement. Oldsmobile's comfortable muscle car could be ordered with a big and nasty W30 package. While the garden variety 1970 442 was quite a bit of car, discerning customers knew at the top of the tree was the W30 option package, which included fiberglass hood with functional scoops and an aluminum intake manifold. The Oldsmobile 442 W-30 package, that gave you a little bit more power than just your standard run of the mill 442. More powerful, a little bit more aggressive cam, a little bit bigger exhaust, a little bit more aggressive carburation. The the difference between the W30 cars and the other 442s was they were special built. The cars were assembled on the assembly line, but the engines were assembled on a special line. And the engines had all hand-picked parts and for all intents and purposes were blueprinted. The Oldsmobile W30 for 1970 was the pinnacle of the Oldsmobile muscle cars. This matching numbers, fully restored coupe sports an ebony black exterior with metallic Aegean gold stripes. The powerful 455 cubic inch engine is managed by a Muncie M21 close ratio four speed with 390 Positronic rear gears. No less impressive is this rally red convertible, one of fewer than 200 automatic W30s. It boasts a number of impressive standard and optional features including air conditioning, purse dual gate shifter, and the very rare all aluminum rear axle. In fact, some of the finest examples of the 1970 GM model year are convertibles, which is unsurprising given the increased popularity of the optional body style. Convertibles, especially in the 1960s, were really popular, but you've got big engines, you've got a convertible, do they always mix? That you had to strengthen the chassis to make up for the fact that the top was no longer there, which made the car heavier. So you had a heavier car, and uh, it didn't have the aerodynamics that, that a closed coupe or fastback would have. The sound, that's one of the real attractions of muscle cars, is the guttural sound you feel in your marrow. You put the top down and you go burbling, looking for trouble in this vehicle. It's just a lot of fun. And then when you nail the throttle and those big dual exhausts just start screaming, and oh, there's nothing like it. Regardless of body style, the 442 W30 made an immediate impact on the public. Like its fellow GM A-bodies, the 442 W30s were fearsome opponents in any straight-line challenge. They all put out similar amounts of power. They were all in the 350 to 375 horsepower range for the most part. The 455 W30 engine put out a 550 pound-foot of torque, which was humongous. It is what really propelled the cars and made them go so fast. They were all stoplight, what we called stoplight racers. That, that's what their purpose in life was, was to give you a real kick when you put your foot on the gas. Um, 
that's what they were designed and built for. Coming up, Buick hits a home run. So for 22 years, Buick GSX was the fastest muscle car, the most powerful muscle car on the planet. Even more so than Oldsmobile, Buick had a long road from patrician automaker to muscle car legitimacy. The Buick Grand Sports and Stage 1s of the late 60s proved that even a luxurious car builder could still bring the thunder when it came to raw performance. But with its GM stablemates hitting their competitive stride in 1970, Buick would need to match or even exceed expectations with its A-body bad boy. And they succeeded beyond anyone's wildest dreams. In the 1960s, the path to power was cubic inches. We're not talking liters here, <laughs> it was cubic inches. Who cares about what a 6.2 engine is, a liter engine? We want 400 plus cubic inches, and Buick embraced this just like everybody else did. When the vehicles were built, when muscle cars, especially General Motors, were being built, the rear ends, the transmissions, some of the really the beefy mechanical components, were cherry-picked for Buick and Oldsmobiles, for 442s and for Grand Sports. The best of the components were put aside for Oldsmobile and Buick. Chevrolet got the rest. At the heart of Buick's world-beating 1970 models was an all-new 455 cubic inch engine. The base model put out 350 horsepower. And thanks to advances in engine production technology, the Buick 455 weighed 150 pounds less than the 454 in top-of-the-line Chevelles. Buick utilized a Rochester Quadrajet carburetor on a cast iron intake manifold atop their regular GS455 engine. It made 350 horsepower, 510 pound-feet, foot-pounds of torque, and was probably underrated, particularly in the horsepower range. This bamboo cream example is owned by drag racing icon Dave McClellan and is one of over 20,000 sold in 1970, over 1,400 of them convertibles. As impressive as the Buick GS was, for an extra $1,200, the discerning customer could drive home in the legendary 1970 Buick GSX, which set a milestone for performance and remains one of the most desirable muscle cars ever built. GSX really reigned as the most powerful mu muscle car from 1970, probably for 22 years. They were rated at 350 horsepower, 360 horsepower for the stage one. And I think that the torque was rated at 510 foot-pounds of torque. So for 22 years, Buick GSX was the fastest muscle car, the most powerful muscle car on the planet. Torque is what rules on the street. Horsepower is great for bragging rights, and if you're in a pure race car. But on the street, torque is what throws the car off the line towards that next stoplight. The tires didn't last long, but you know, the muscle cars were a tire dealer's best friend. They really were. The GSX package added front and rear spoilers, body stripes, a heavy duty suspension, and a hood tack but these were no mere aesthetic refinements. The front spoiler was basically supposed to put force down on the nose. The deck wing was actually designed to put force down on the, on the rear as for high speed. The hood scoop takes low pressure from the center of the hood, rams it into the carburetor uh, for better performance. The hood tack, a lot easier to read on the hood than it is inside the car. Um, if the car has a tilt wheel, you can barely see the gauge on that one side. The appearance of all this stuff just makes the car stand out. And just as other 1970 A-bodies had embraced styling as an essential part of the muscle car package, the GSX strove to outshine every other car on the road. Because of the styling of the GSX, it was really the first time people started paying attention. Look at it, it's, it's radioactive. It's, it's yellow, Saturn yellow, meaning they could see it from Saturn. The color scheme, I think, started turning people's heads. Today, the Buick GSX, along with many other high-performance GMA bodies from 1970, are among the most collectible cars of the era. 
But more than that, they're a way for people to reconnect with the horsepower dreams of their youth. For me, there, it's not an image. It's something for everybody. Most people our age, want, they want to recapture their youth. They wanted to get the car that they couldn't afford when they were in high school. So this is what that means to me. My friend Larry picked me up in 1970. He had a Buick GS. And I, I just looked at this big freaking boat. And I'll tell you something, that car separated the men from the boys. It just took off. It took probably five years off my pathetic life. It was amazing. When he was wrapping the gears, I, was, I couldn't believe what was happening. In a golden age of horsepower, GM's 1970 muscle cars stood as some of the very best performance vehicles built. Sadly, 1971 would see the beginning of a long period of lower compression, decreased horsepower, and finally smaller engines. But these burly 1970 A bodies live on as a testament to the enduring legacy of high performance. From Vic's garage, at the historic headquarters of Edelbrock in Torrance, California. I'm Chip Foose, and we'll see you next time on American Icon, the muscle car.